there's a glare. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'll be telling you about all of the bookish and nerdy things I've done in the month of March aside from actual reading. March has been interesting, to say the least, and I think the general sentiment amongst book people is that our lifestyle hasn't changed all that much. I did try to force myself to go out to events all this time to do nerding out kind of things and obviously I had to eliminate a bunch of those this month but I did get a chance to go to two events at the very beginning of the month and those two are what I'll be telling you about today. But before I do, I will mention the one thing that I nerded over for about a week, which was Ancestry.com. I mentioned it in my nerding out and self-isolation ideas video. I finally got a chance to construct my own family tree and go up the tree as much as I could. And I got all the way to the 1700s. So just kind of piecing it all together, going through newspaper clippings and obituaries was a lot of fun. And I cannot recommend that enough if you haven't done it. So the first actual public event that I went to was was the Winnie the Pooh exhibit at the Royal Ontario Museum. It was so well put together and so cute and cozy. I went on opening day. I'm glad I did because it closed shortly after. The exhibit looked at A.A. A. Milne's kind of conception of Winnie the Pooh and his correspondence with his illustrator Shepard and his correspondence with his family. Also, it sort of started with his Canadian origins. I don't know if a lot of you know this, but Winnie the Pooh was based on an actual bear in the military who was a female bear from Winnipeg. And because the bear was from Winnipeg, she was named Winnie. But it was also kind of merged with some toys that the son of A.A. Milne had. Now these toys are located at the New York Public Library and they were not part of the exhibit. So when I saw the toys within the exhibit, the description said uh, these are reproductions and you could tell. You could tell they were reproductions. There were also some illustrations or woodcuts that were facsimiles instead of the original pieces. So. Those two were a little bit disappointing for such a large exhibit, but all of the correspondence and the illustrations were originals. And the design of the entire exhibit was spectacular. We got to see uh, so many aspects of Winnie the Pooh, including different editions of the books that were published, including first editions, Disney adaptations, and a lot of parodies. I happen to have a few of the parodies myself, but I have not read them. But this exhibit really made me consider going through them. Um, it just gave me all of the good feels, you know. It's just Winnie the Pooh, what's not to love. I then went to our local theater that features only documentaries. And they were playing this one documentary called The Booksellers. And I got the sort of newspaper with the, the cover. I'll put something on the screen with the actual poster. So, this documentary, I have so many thoughts and feelings and I'd like to share them with you. First off, as soon as you get a chance to see it online, do make a note to see it. It is like a treat for the eyes. It features all of the rare bookstores in New York City. It's very New York centric and it looks as kind of the origins of the book collector's trade and it interviews a bunch of people who own rare bookstores and kind of their beginnings and their lives as businessmen and businesswomen and how certain things impact their life and the way they collect and some of them are really in high circles like we're talking about people who bought and sold Gutenberg Bibles, which are worth like millions of dollars. And then it looks at kind of the conventions and the larger shops and sales that they have and how they interact with customers. You also get to see their personal collection. And I think this is where it becomes a treat because it's kind of like beyond looking at a booktuber's personal collection, you get to see a bookseller who has such rare gems and they kind of discuss them at length in a sort of book history style, the way I've done with some of the videos in the past. Now, some of the things that were featured in this documentary were also book collectors that went off the normal, usual path. So for example, the woman who collected the first rare books sold, published, and written by women, she kind of was on the scene a little bit earlier. She kind of got a chance to collect all of these really rare 
um, female writers before they were kind of valuable in the sense of a rare book. My favorite of the bookstores mentioned was the one that's in this picture, but it's called the Bookstore of Imagination. And all of the books within the bookstore have to do with imagination or the creativity of the mind. But the coolest part is that the bookshop owner said that he doesn't organize them at all so they're all at random so if you walk in there your imagination gets to kind of explore and figure things out so it's kind of an experience just walking in there there were some cool special guests including susan orlean the author of the library book it sort of transitions out into the online sphere and talking about how things like ape books or rare book websites kind of ruined the fun of the hunt. They did kind of mention how this is both a blessing and a curse. If you really need the book, it's, it's great because you can get it really fast and it will arrive at your doorstep. If, however, you're kind of part of the industry, it's a little bit sad because it takes away from part of the pleasure of the trade. Now, I do have a little bit of a criticism and this is a very hot topic for me personally. And I will kind of insert a lot of my personal experience in this but the documentary ends on this comment and the comment was kind of shared by a bunch of the older booksellers and it just it irked me a little bit and I want to talk about that basically it ends with them saying oh well it's such a shame that the young people of today are not as interested in this thing and um, yeah that's unfortunate it's too bad I guess it's just gonna die off. So many stores have closed. I guess the young people of today just don't have the interest. And it's a sentiment I've heard repeated by booksellers and bookstore owners from Toronto. And it's a sentiment I've heard even from librarians. And I do not think that that comment is called for or even true. For one, I think they're confusing young people with customers and that's not the same thing. I have personally bought many books, both rare and new and used, and I have been a member of all of these things, right? But there's a big difference between me going in there as a user and customer, right? And me asking them for opportunities to work within the field. From my personal experience, two or three out of the bookstores that have shut down in Toronto, the rare book ones, I have not only fought for them when the neighborhood was being either gentrified or things were being sold or, um, you know, people were kind of targeting this bookstore to be shut down. I have fought for them, but I've also been there so many times asking if there are any opportunities to volunteer, to help out, to work part time, to have a form of apprenticeship. And they always, always said no. And I understand that you don't have the money maybe to pay somebody, but volunteer work and apprenticeship work is completely different and I found that even there they were kind of exclusive. For me to hear these booksellers in the documentary kind of say the same thing made me think okay you know what no you don't get to say stuff like this unless you have at least proof that maybe three or four times in your life you have put out posters and signs and announcements offering opportunities for young people to participate in this field of yours where they get to apprentice and you you offer this opportunity to them to enter the field and then they all said no or no one tried out because i really doubt that that's the case so for me it was kind of offensive to find that older people think that our entire generation is somehow opposed to all of this especially since we're hipsters for the most part and to me that just it didn't sit right um, and I was very frustrated and I find that even in librarianship work a lot of young people are trying so hard to find work in libraries and they're working part-time and night shifts and weekend shifts for years just to get an opportunity to eventually be a part of the full-time staff so I don't think it's fair to confuse young aspiring professionals within the rare book trade or the librarianship field to confuse them with customers because it's not the same thing and you don't get to say that your field is dying because of the lack of interest of a younger generation if you didn't step in to train and to help 
and and I've seen this even like within workforces where like older people will complain about younger people but never offer support or help or encouragement or opportunities to learn that's all I'm gonna say on that end comment I think I ranted a bit too much on that I'm sorry, but it's just a hot topic for me and it, it bothers me a lot, especially since I've spent a lot of time studying all of this stuff and so have a lot of people in my generation. I then carried on and watched a documentary at home on metal typefaces. I shared it with you on YouTube and on Twitter because it was offering a free coupon and you could watch it and rent it for free. Um, it was very interesting, really well done. It was a lot of review for me. It was a lot of the stuff that I've seen before and um, it was just really well filmed. I really enjoyed this documentary. I will link it down below. I then tried to start the project I announced at the end of February about nature writing. This project is a half-formed beast and I'm going to take you through the process because at this point I don't have a finished product. The weather has been changing a lot on a day-to-day -day basis. The first day I started my nature journal, um, I bought one just to have for this experience and I started taking like pictures of my walk. I don't know how you can see this and then I wrote my feelings and then I found some snails and I printed the pictures and I tried to make it all nice and then I found like a leaf that was kind of mossy and all of these red things and I tried to be reflective in a similar way that I've seen done in like a throw notebook or something like that but then I didn't really know what else to say so I just put it aside and I thought okay you know what let's just go film and on the first day I went out it was snowing, but it was like snowstorming. It was snow everywhere. I got a chance to put my feet in the snow and I love that crunchy sound when you like jump or walk on the snow. It's like the best sound in the world other than like skates, going on a skating rink. After that things got rainy then it got really sunny and I didn't have a cohesive video because at first I was gonna make it about winter and then I was gonna make it about reflecting in the journal and then after that we went into quarantine the only thing you're gonna see is the inside of my apartment for the next little bit so since going into quarantine I have been working on videos for you reading obviously I watched some documentaries and some movies and then the last thing that I did was an interesting turn of events. My work, because of the quarantine, has requested that we start making instructional videos for students on how to use like medical databases and how to navigate certain things. So basically during my work day at home, I end up working on what is essentially a YouTube video. but doesn't go for YouTube, it's for our personal college. I've just been filming and scripting and filming and editing and it's just been like an interesting kind of turn of events. I did not expect that to happen and I'm enjoying it. So I would like to hear from you. How are you doing? How are things in isolation? Definitely comment anything you'd like. I'll see you in my next video. Bye!